This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected. Like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put in their Lululemons and take a yoga class while drinking a green juice. If you experience any of these symptoms, text your priest immediately. All right, welcome Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining me. I'm Allison Melody, and it's November 4th. It is the day after Election Day 2020, and as of this recording, we still have no president. So if you need an escape from the chaos, I definitely have a great show for you, non-political, and it's really three fascinating people doing really cool things. And real quick, I just want to talk about voting because yes, voting is important. I love doing my part to be civically engaged. Um, But I see all these ads about voting and vote like your life depends on it because it does. And yes, I agree. But also we can vote every single day. We can vote with our shopping cart, with what foods we choose to consume by creating more demand for healthy, affordable food. This is Food Heals, right? We can vote every day for the Food Heals world. We can vote with our wallet and donate to causes or nonprofits with missions we believe in, that we admire, that we support. Think about this. When you shop at a local business, you tell the world, your neighborhood and the people in your community are worth more than that big box store or that big online place, right? You know what I'm talking about. I don't need to call anyone out. When you purchase organic food, you tell the world that you want more farmers to grow healthy organic food. When you buy from a business owned by a woman or a person of color or anyone who's been marginalized in society, you help build a more inclusive economy. When you buy certified fair trade, you literally fight poverty. When you don't buy something, when you choose not to choose consumerism. You tell the world that your worth is not defined by your stuff. So no matter who wins the presidency, it's up to us to create the world we want to see, to create the world we want to live in, to not play the victim of our circumstances, but instead rise up and realize that our power is with the people. It is in our hands and be the change we wish to see. You all know the quote, be the change you want to see in the world. Okay, rant over now onto the show. Today, I am talking with three incredible individuals with innovative approaches to public health that are disrupting the norm. First up, you'll be hearing from John Iarillo, who's going to share with us a refreshing alternative for managing large healthcare costs through medical cost sharing. So what does that mean? It means you share medical funds with like-minded, healthy individuals and receive premium care through an organization run with compassion. Then I'll be chatting with my friend, who is the CEO and founder of Music Changing Lives, Josiah Bruni. Josiah worked for some of the greatest stars in the music industry, like Master P and Ice Cube, and he learned the ins and outs of the business in order to develop a path for at-risk youth to create music in their communities and learn entrepreneurial skills to help them retain their rights to their music. And he helps entrepreneurs, young and old, create a career out of music and understand how music can change their lives. And finally, I'll be chatting with Rob Rast, who dropped out of college, moved to China, started a reality show, and went on to launch multiple successful businesses. Rob's mission is to get people out of cars and get them back onto bicycles with his one-of-a-kind electric bike, the Baby Maker. But first, Food Heals Nation, if the current state of affairs makes you crave a good glass of wine every now and then, or every night, no judgment, I wanted to share with you my latest discovery. It is clean, crafted, vegan wine, because not all wine is vegan 
opinion, not all wine is clean. There's a lot of additives and sulfites and stuff we don't need in our bodies and wine. But I've discovered the one that is the cleanest and most delicious and the most beautiful packaging. It's Scout and Cellar. And you can buy that right now for yourself, for your friends, for your Thanksgiving dinner or holiday parties at scoutandcellar.com slash foodheals. You'll get 5% off six bottles of wine, 10% off 12 bottles of wine, plus free shipping. I'm going to let the founder tell you more about why clean crafted is the way to go when it comes to wine. Roll it, Roxy. Hey there, my name is Sarah Shadnicks. I'm the CEO and founder of Scout and Cellar. We're going to take you on a journey from grape to glass. Clean crafted wine starts in the vineyard. That's where the difference begins. All the people that are involved in clean crafted are passionate about caring for our earth, caring for their families, caring for the future generations. And we get a chance to meet them in a variety of ways through our current grower relationships. And we become introduced to them by going to their vineyards, by breaking bread with them, by shaking hands with them, by getting their soil in our boots. Right before harvest, we're checking for chemical pesticides and lots of other yucky stuff. Stuff we don't want in our bodies, stuff we don't want in the ground. So harvest is a really special time at Scout and Cellar. It's an exciting time. You can feel the buzz in, in the air. The grapes are harvested by hand. They're harvested in very small lots often at night or in the cool morning air. So again, the time of day matters during harvest because it protects the grapes. So after our clean crafted grapes are harvested by hand and taken to the winery, they're sorted by hand very carefully to make sure that any yucky stuff is removed. So after the grapes are hand sorted, we have to extract the yumminess that's inside of them. So for white grapes, we press them and for red grapes, we crush them. The fermentation process is very slow and that ensures that all of the deliciousness that's present in the terroir, that's present in the grapes, that's present in the skins and red wine is extracted slowly and perfectly so that it can be present in your glass at the end. So after wine is fermented at Scout and Cellar, then it's put into some kind of an aging vessel. There's lots of different kinds of aging vessels. Stainless steel, concrete egg, neutral barrels, or new barrels. So after the wine is finished aging, it's time to test it again because we're all about making sure that we're delivering a clean crafted wine every single time. So now that the wine has passed our second lab test, it's time to put it in a bottle. And so we're creating our own brands. We're bottling our own wines all around the country and we're working with farmers, with growers, with family owned wineries, with the little guy, with the independent guy that are committed to clean crafted, whether for generations or that have become committed to clean crafted because of Scout Cellar. And our bottling practices are also consistent with our clean crafted mission. We bottle in lighter glass so that when we ship it around the country, it creates a smaller carbon footprint. We bottle in eco-friendly cork and we don't use foil. It doesn't provide a benefit to the wine and it's not good for the environment. So now's the best part. We get to enjoy the clean crafted wine that was grown and made so thoughtfully and carefully. We get to pop the cork and share it with friends and family and share the story of the deliciousness of the clean crafted wine. And so clean crafted is the only standard that guarantees that what goes into the bottle and into your glass is free from any yucky stuff. So there you have it. The clean crafted journey started with people and it ends with people. You see at Scout and Cellar, we're all about gathering around a clean crafted wine and creating a better wine drinking experience to share with friends and family and those that we love. So thank you to Sarah, the founder and CEO of Scout and Cellar for explaining that so eloquently. So Food Heals Nation, avoid those pesky wine hangovers by drinking clean, vegan, sulfate-free, additive-free wine in the most beautiful packaging you've ever seen by going to scoutandcellar.com slash foodheals. That's scout, S-C-O-U-T, and cellar, C-E-L-L-A-R, dot com slash food heals. You'll save big, you'll get free shipping, and you can even join the wine club to get new delicious bottles every month. Scoutandcellar.com slash food heals. Now my interviews with three innovators in the public health space. First up, my interview with John. Roll it, Roxy. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. The Phoenix Business Journal named him a young gun under 40 executive, and in his spare time, he's an avid fitness and cyclist enthusiast who believes aging is for idiots. Please welcome John Iarillo. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you. I'm so glad that Thomas T-Rock, shout outs to T-Rock, introduced us. So yeah, how is aging for idiots? Tell me more about that. Well, when you become 53 years old, you have to come up with some excuse to motivate yourself and with nutrition and fitness and everything else that you can learn as you age, I truly believe, at least from the neck down, that you can control most everything. And you know, I take pride in that and 
look forward to meeting many fitness goals, even as I age. So it's something I take a lot of pride in. Yeah, I agree. I think that aging is just about how you feel and how old you decide you are. You know, it's like we can stay young and we can stay vibrant for much longer than I think is like portrayed in the media and much longer than people think that they can. Right. I agree. Following the older athletes is always exciting to me now. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. All right. So, John, can you give us some background and let Food Heals Nation know a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, From a professional perspective, I started my career at Deloitte & Touche as a CPA in the audit department um, in Cleveland, Ohio, and then subsequently moved out to Phoenix, Arizona to get out of the cold weather. And as I grew in that environment, I was hired by one of my clients who wanted to take a company public during the dot-com boom in 1997. So I was able to do that, take a company public, live through that experience, open up the stock market um, by ringing the bell. And then obviously the dot-com boom soon turned into a bus and I turned my attention to the insurance markets and went through that in 2001, right after 9-11. So that was a tough environment from that perspective. And then did that for a number of years and then migrated over to real estate. And then 2007 and eight and nine experienced the upturn and subsequent downturn of that. So I take a lot of pride in going into industries that um, have explosive growth and hit the wall very hard as well. So I think I'm part of the problem in some industries, but returning (laughs) to insurance, things have been great for accelerated our company and this is where I'm probably going to end my career. Well, thank you for being part of the problem so we can all learn what not to do. I'm just kidding. Um, So all of these experiences in business led you to this medical cost sharing. And I really want to hear a little bit more about what that means and what that is. So can you talk about medical cost sharing? Yeah. So a little bit about Accelerate. We do a number of different things. Medical cost sharing is one of those. So from Accelerate, we do a lot of things. We do executive consulting where we take over the chief operating officer, chief executive officer, chief financial officer of small companies to help them navigate, you know, as they grow. You know, we also do software development in the workers' compensation space with some large companies that we've been doing that for about 17 years. And we also place business in the workers' compensation industry, primarily in the PEO industry, a professional employer organization. So we help companies that have difficulty obtaining workers' compensation place their insurance, and then obviously provide all the ancillary payroll, employee benefits, HR type services to those entities as well. And through that, what happened was a lot of our you know, clients said, hey, we really need an affordable healthcare product to offer our employees because what's out there now after you know, Affordable Care Act came out, there was nothing really affordable or usable by the employee base. You know, if you're making you know, $12 an hour or even $50,000, $70,000 a year, it was difficult for employees to utilize their their high deductible health care plans with the Uniteds or Aetnas or Humanas of the world. So we, you know, went out and we sought out a few companies, one being Sidera, which is a medical cost sharing opportunity, which is not insurance. It's health care through community, which everyone in the community shares in the health care of the members. So it's something that's very different. It's typically 50 to 60 percent cheaper than traditional health insurance without a lot of the out-of-pocket obligation. So we sought out to find something. I don't know if we were lucky or skilled in finding that, but we found a real solution for our employees. And over the last two and a half, three years, we've been really focused on educating the market and educating our clients and prospects to really do something that's a little bit different, educate them and show them what's available in the marketplace. And we're pretty proud of that. I think a lot of people don't realize that there are other options other than what they're being presented when it comes to insurance choices. So I would love for you to kind of break down, you know, what's the difference between traditional health insurance and medical cost sharing? Right. So, you know, traditional insurance as we know it today uh, is typically high deductibles with high out-of-pocket obligations. And the monthly premiums are significant and they typically go up 5, 10, 15% every year. And we've become accustomed to accepting these increases. But at a certain point, you know, everything breaks, especially for those who 
aren't making six figure type incomes. And even those making six figure type incomes are tired of the whole status quo. But I don't think the individuals in the marketplace are educated to understand what's exactly out there. So medical cost sharing, just to give a little bit of a background, when the Affordable Care Act came out, there was probably 100,000 individuals, primarily through faith-based organizations that were participating in medical cost sharing. Sidera came about, I think, four or five years ago, and they're a non-faith-based type organization. So, you know, typically a faith-based organization will have you sign off saying, you know, you believe in certain aspects of faith and what have you, which may or may not work in the business community. Sidera is a non-faith-based medical cost sharing organization. So it really provides a large opportunity for employers and for individuals. So we sell to both employer groups and to individuals who are just seeking an alternative to the traditional healthcare model. So we really are out there trying to educate. And like I said, there's 100,000 people when the Affordable Care Act came out. Now there's well in excess of 1.5 to 1.75 million individuals that are using medical cost sharing as a means of their health care deliverable. Wow. And it saves us money, right? I remember, I think Tom was telling me that a typical family of four, you know, was spending with an income of like 100K was spending $28,000 on average on health care. And it's like that comes close to bankrupting a family with all the other expenses that they have of just living a regular life. So how does medical cost sharing, you know, save people money? Remember what we're doing here, it's a number of different things. One, the monthly share, because they don't call it premiums because it's not insurance, are typically 50 to 60% cheaper. And in addition, when you're using medical cost sharing, you become a cash paying patient. So what you're doing with the help of the medical cost sharing or Sidera in this case, they are working with the providers, the doctors, the hospitals, you know, the emergency rooms and what have you to renegotiate the price of the service of the medical care. So what you basically are doing is they're negotiating significant discounts or cash paying discounts on your behalf. They reimburse you the cost of the medical care, and then you remit those funds to the individuals or organizations or hospitals that provided that medical care for you. And in addition, you really don't have those significant out-of-pocket or deductibles. They have what's called an initial unshareable amount, which you choose from 500 to 1,000 or 1,500, and that will cover 100% of your need. And the need is, say, for instance, you broke your leg and you had to have surgery, you had to have physical therapy, you had to have medication. Until you're fully released from the doctor and after you meet that initial unshareable amount of 500 or 1,000 or whatever amount you select, the medical cost sharing organization, the community will share in paying all those expenses on your behalf. So you're not going to come out of pocket for $5,000 deductible or an $8,000 additional out of pocket obligation. It's really going to cost you $500 or $1,000 to get yourself back to health on that one particular medical need, as they call it. So it's, it's a significant difference. It's transparent. It's really negotiating the cost of your care. You know, for example, you know, an x-ray, if you went through your United Healthcare plan, might have an out-of-pocket of, you know, three, four hundred dollars, whereas medical cost sharing, it could be as low as thirty dollars because it's negotiated, it's looking out for the best of the community. It's significant. And what I like about it is it sounds like to me, it really is, you know, people helping other people. It's a person to person type of you know, company versus the insurance companies who are deliberately overpaying hospitals to make sure that their revenues continue to grow. I feel like there's all these backdoor deals with insurance companies. No one's looking out for their humans' best interest, where it sounds to me like medical cost sharing is really looking out for the individual as as a human being, right? Right. It's looking out for the community. You know, it's like getting a bunch of friends in a room and you're not trying to you know, make more than your friend in the room. You're just trying to help each other out and make sure that community as well. Now, they want you to live healthy lifestyles and make good habits as it relates to smoking. So if you smoke, there's a surcharge of $75 per month, but that's pretty understandable. I mean, we want the members of the community to live healthy lives and do the best they can to take care of themselves. So we're not spending money on, you know, unnecessary medical needs. 
And what about like networks and choosing your own doctor and all of that stuff that comes up when we're trying to navigate this confusing like insurance world? How does that work? Great question. It's a freedom from networks. So basically you have the ability to choose any doctor, any network, you know, or there is no network. So you choose any doctor, any facility that you see fit. So you can go out and choose, you know, the best facility for your particular need. And what's even better with that, they use uh, an entity called Second MD. So if you do need surgery, they'll submit your medical information to Second MD, which is basically a panel of board certified surgeons and doctors from the likes of Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic to assess whether the prescribed surgery or prescribed medical treatment is necessary and in your best interest. So you're really getting a second opinion to ensure that you're going to get the best care possible for your particular sickness or injury or whatever it may be. So it, it's an amazing you know, second look to ensure that you're getting the best treatment possible and you're going to get the treatment a lot faster than a traditional insurance. For example, one of our business partners needed a knee replacement, but the traditional United Healthcare's of the world wanted to, him to go through injections and through a number of different procedures, even though his doctor says, at the end of the day, you will need a knee replacement, but this is the protocol we need to follow. So he had to follow a prescribed protocol for six to 12 months and then underwent a knee replacement after the fact. So he had to delay his recovery and his ability to feel good as a human being because we had to go through certain protocols that the insurance companies drive you know, individuals too, as opposed to let's do the right thing right now and get you back to health. And how does like our choices come into play? Because it's like, okay, um, for me, for example, I do not visit traditional Western medicine doctors for my health care. I tend to go to naturopaths, nutritionists, alternative medicine practitioners, functional medicine doctors for all of my health needs. And so how does that come into play here? Is that something I can decide? Is that something that's covered? Yes, naturopaths are becoming a larger um, component of the healthcare deliverable here. And, you know, like myself, I use a naturopath as well. So there are certain aspects that are covered through that. The great thing is you can call the 1-800 number at Sidera. They'll walk you through what your options are, make sure that it is covered by the community. And that's the great thing. You always have someone looking out and being your advocate for your medical care. So I think those are significant differences I don't think you or certainly not I have called my traditional health care company, had a discussion on what's the best treatment plan for me as an individual and here are the beliefs I have or you know, I don't I don't like taking any medication or what have you. So those are things that they'll help you navigate through. And obviously there's cost, you know, saving components that they try to utilize because they're trying to do what's best for the community. But the first and foremost important thing is you and getting you back to health. Yeah, I love that. That's how it should be. And it's such a travesty that that's not how it is in this country. It's really absurd. It's a major issue. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't think politicians have the answer of it. So, you know, companies like Sidera and individuals like us trying to educate, you know, the community and individuals and companies out there, there are alternatives that are lower cost, better deliverable, and get you better a lot quicker than traditional methods have done in the past. Absolutely. That's amazing. So can you tell me about like, what's the relationship between Sidera and Accelerated Pure Health? So we're basically an affiliate um, that, you know, sells and educates the marketplace on behalf of Sidera. And we offer Sidera as one of our premier offerings to our clients and to individuals. Like I said earlier, we sell this to individuals and to employer groups. You know, the great thing with Sidera, they're allowing us to go out to individuals. So even individuals who have uh, a sponsored health care plan through the traditional health carriers in the country, they can utilize those, but they don't like the out-of-pocket obligations. They can still sign up for what we call Sidera Access, which is an individual product and save the money and utilize health care at a much affordable offering. So it's something that we continue to educate and offer that to, and you know, we're rolling it out to large employer groups. Um, we, we're just about to roll it out to a company with 300,000 worksite employees, so we're, we're getting ready to do that. So I think people are starting to understand the power that this brings 
and the significant saving opportunities that exist. And what about if somebody, you know, there's so many horror stories out there. You hear it all the time, people being bankrupt by their medical bills because they suddenly got cancer or something like that. Things weren't covered. So can membership be dropped or what happens if someone all of a sudden has higher medical needs than they ever had before? You know, the great thing is, is is Sidera basically take a portion of the member share contributions every month and set it aside for what they call large needs. And they paid all of the medical needs of the community that were eligible for sharing since their inception. And they continue to set aside extra funds for what they call large needs. But for example, we had a, a client here who's uh, you know endodontist practice. They had an individual that had a significant health issue. The medical costs three months into the relationship with Sidera were in excess of $500,000. Family called us and said, we've never been taking such good care of, concerned about our well-being. All the medical bills were paid for. They were in constant communication with not only us, but our medical providers to ensure that we were all comfortable with the treatment plan, the plan of attack, and the most important part, the payment at the end of the day. Because once you're healthy, now you have this financial burden or you think you may have this financial burden, but all the bills were paid. Obviously, they were probably negotiated significantly lower than $500,000 that we were provided, but they were ecstatic about it. And they said, can we do a testimonial on your behalf? Those are some of the great stories. So, you know, to date, They are very cognizant of the financial obligations to the community, and they are taking all the, you know, what we believe the right protocols to put in place to ensure that the community is strong from a financial perspective, and they're going to be providing this for a number of years to come. Well, that's beautiful, and I'm so glad, you know, families are getting what they need and what they should be getting and not getting healthy and then getting bankrupt, like you said, which is absolutely ridiculous that that's how our system is set up. Let's say we get our health back and then we're bankrupt. Well, that doesn't make you healthy. That makes you crazy. It makes you sick and probably causes you more grief and additional sickness comes from that. Stress. Yeah, and then you get a heart attack from the stress of it. (laughs) Correct, correct. Cortisol levels are through the roof. Exactly. So um, I love how this is a community. And I know that you said like one of the things that is expected of members is that you're going to do your best. You're going to take personal responsibility for your health. So can you tell me about that aspect and how sure. is there encouragement for us to you know come together, to stay healthy together? How do we get more information on staying healthy? Obviously, I have my show and this is one of my passions, but if someone was just starting out, what, what would they need to know? They want you to choose a healthy lifestyle. For example, you know, diet, exercise, lifestyle can improve your quality of life and that's you know, things that they're promoting. I think they say when like-minded, healthy individuals get together and choose to share healthcare expenses, everyone wins. Now, one of the things that they will not do if is if you're in an accident and you are using illicit drugs or narcotics, they will not share the medical need resulting from that. So there are some limitations as it relates to that because, you know, they don't want the community sharing in expenses in the medical cost of very poor decisions in life. So that's one of the things that they're very aware of and you know are trying to educate the community and the members to stay away from. So we as an organization always try to communicate to individuals or to employer groups of this, you know, very important choosing a healthy lifestyle as an important aspect of utilizing medical cost sharing. It sounds like it's made for me. Like I am an entrepreneur, so I don't have anyone, you know, paying my medical. uh, So I have to buy it on my own and I'm very, very healthy. So it sounds like it's made for me. Who is it really geared towards? It is geared towards individuals that don't have pre-existing conditions. Um, You know, there is some limitations in the first three years. If you've been treated in the last three years with a medical issue, say for instance, you know, you had a heart attack or a knee replacement in the last three years. If you have a medical need resulting from that pre-existing condition, there is limitations in the first three years. And then in year four, there are no limitations. So there are things like that where they're trying to control people joining up with significant medical issues and trying to utilize the community to share in those medical needs. So there is that aspect that's I think the only real limitation of medical cost sharing is the pre-existing conditions. But 
for someone like yourself or someone like me who you know, do everything we can to put good food in our bodies and exercise all the time, I think it's a it's a great model. I mean, it's it's going to save us a significant amount of money. And if we do become sick, I'm I'm rushing and you know doing everything I can to get better as soon as I can. So what do you think, if you could say, the biggest problem about traditional insurance that medical cost sharing really solves for us? I think the biggest problem with you know, traditional insurance is you have these large public entities that are based and driven on earnings and Wall Street expectations. So the only way for them to you know, increase their stock price and their return to investors is to raise premiums and have the consumer pay a larger portion of their medical expenses because it's the only way it's going to work for you know these large entities who are answering to you know Wall Street and to shareholders and you know there's a lot of conflict of interest with you know the physician or the prescription groups and the medical um, surgical centers that are owned by the doctors. So there's all kinds of conflicts of interest that are driving unnecessary money to not solve a medical need, but to line the pockets of those who are in control. Whereas, you know, medical cost sharing is really trying to provide medical resources to those individuals in the community at a fair price and do it expeditiously. You don't have to go through all these steps because the traditional insurance company is telling you you have to go through seven steps, even though the doctor says these seven steps are not going to benefit you in the long run. There's really no benefit to you, but we're going to follow these protocols, spend a lot of your money because you have to meet your deductible and out-of-pocket obligation. And then at the end of the day, we'll, we'll do the surgery. And you know, if we're lucky, we'll, we'll flip you into the next plan year and you'll have to pay it all over again. So that, that's the one thing with the, the medical cost sharing. A need doesn't necessarily drive by anniversary dates or things like that. It's a medical need that could go on for 12 to 13 to 14 months. And your total out-of-pocket obligation is that initial unshareable amount, which might only be $500 or $1,000. It's something very, very different. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine the cost savings would be huge in cases like that. And it just seems to me that, you know, the insurance companies and the entire medical establishment as a whole is more about the money than the human and getting the human back to health. You know, we live in a world where keeping us as individuals sick keeps them in business and profitable. And it sounds like this is, you know, kind of the solution to that or the alternative to that, the best one that I've heard of that exists today, at least. <laughs> right. And if you meet the executive team and the employees at Sidera, you'd fall in love with them. You'll, you'll see that they're genuine. The corporate culture is second to none. They are people who actually care about their members. They care about the community. It's a much different approach to providing affordable health care to individuals. And it, it's something that, you know, once you're around it, it's, you know, infectious. It's, it's great to see. And so are you able to get a lot of companies to provide this for their workers as well? Yes, it's grown significantly. You know, like I said, we've only been doing it for about two and a half years and we're adding new employer groups all the time. We're starting to add larger organizations like PEOs who aggregate employers together. So we're starting to offer it at a much larger scale now. And like I said, it doesn't fit for everyone, but we're seeing a significant opportunity or significant growth just from our perspective, from Accelerated's perspective. And then on the individual basis, we're having individuals sign up every month. We're out there trying to do some marketing and it's really more education than marketing. We think that an informed consumer is the best consumer. We want to be transparent in what they're getting into so they understand it. And really our philosophy is let's educate to the best of our abilities to make sure that they understand how the medical cost sharing community works and why it's a good thing, or maybe it's not a fit for you as an individual. You have some significant health issues, or you just need to pay for your expensive health insurance through the traditional means. And you know, sometimes people just want to do that. They're nervous about being proactive in their health care. And you know, this is a little more proactive, but for people like yourself or people like me, I like being proactive. That's what I do every day. So if I have yeah. a medical need, I have no problem taking control and managing it on my own behalf. 
Yep. Okay, great. I feel the same way. So let's say um, if someone was going to sign up, what does the process look like? I looked at the website and for my age range, it was said it started around 200 a month, which is very, very, very inexpensive compared to um, what I was paying last year, which was 400, which I thought was absurd because I didn't use it right. ever. Yeah, if you're I using a natural path, medication. you're coming out of pocket. Yeah. So I, I'll be at my natural path tomorrow. So I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if someone signs up, like take me through the process of what it looks like. Okay, I'm paying my monthly and now I want to go to the doctor. I need to go to the doctor. Who do I call? You know, like I was saying, like, okay, can I call Dr. Stephen Cabral? And is this covered? That type of thing. Yeah. So we always say the best thing to do is always call. Sidera, because they're going to hold your hand and walk you through the process. Now, obviously, if it's an emergency, you were hit by a car that you don't have that opportunity and, you know, Sidera will get involved after the fact. But I always like, hey, utilize the resources that are available to you. They're going to hold your hand. They're going to walk you through. They're going to make sure that you're getting the best deal possible, the best care expeditiously. So it's a pretty simple process. Always call when you can, and they'll walk you exactly through the process to ensure that you're getting the proper care for whatever your need may be. They do also have a teledoc that you can call into as well. So you have that opportunity as well. So could someone call in advance and check in and say, these are the doctors that I prefer to visit? Sure. Yeah, you could definitely do that. The better you plan on anything, as you know, the better the outcome is. So if you can facilitate the process and the discussions beforehand, because there are some doctors that are out there, like for instance, you know, the best knee replacement doctor here in Scottsdale, Arizona, wants to be paid in advance. So, you know, traditionally you're paying for medical surgeries or what have you after the fact. But if you want the best doctor possible, sometimes you have to facilitate an agreement with the physician group or the hospital for a payment in advance. And Sidera will work with those physicians to ensure that you can get the care you want or the required care from the doctor of choice. So there are some instances where you know, doctors want money up front because they're the best at their specialty and are able to demand that. And you know, a lot of these doctors are you know, trying to buck the insurance trend and, and put the insurance reimbursement in the traditional sense back on the consumer, which is not an easy process. Right. And that's not how it should be. And, you know, I feel like a lot of times when it comes to all of this, it's like there's someone in a back room just checking out, we'll pay for that. No, nah, not this. Oh, we'll pay for that. No, nah, not this. And it's like not based on anything in reality. And people are shocked when they get their bill because they're like, why isn't all of this covered? Right. For example, Steve, one of our partners had his knee replaced. And this was before he was on medical cost sharing. And after the knee replacement, they sent him a bill saying, oh, by the way, the anesthesiologist was not in network. So you owe an extra thousands of dollars. How, oh. how is Steve supposed to know who's in network or who's not in network? He's going to get a surgery. He's not looking around the operating room asking questions. Who's in the network? Who's not in the network? Because I have to make sure that I can afford you know, this surgery after the fact. Right. And that should not be his job. He is the patient. Correct. <laughs> Correct. He actually, um, because we're involved in this industry and everything else, they ended up, you know, eating that bill, but it was pretty funny that they were trying to send him a bill after the fact without disclosing any of this prior to his surgical procedure. Oh my God. It's, it's like they are a racket. That's exactly what they are. For sure. For sure. <laughs> it is a mafia. I'm really, really intrigued. I think it sounds absolutely great. I mean, just the word medical cost sharing brings me more peace than the word insurance, which brings me literally fear Correct. <laughs> when I think about it. You have the telemedicine, if that's available, just to ask questions. You have the nation's top doctors with what they call second MD. You have counseling service, and then you have a personal member advisor walking you through every step of the way, whether it's transferring records from one doctor to the next maybe recommending, you know, the best physician or hospital for your medical need. You know, they'll work through scheduling for you. I mean, th there's so much effort that they're putting in to make it easy for you. It's like a concierge service for your medical need. You're not going to get this with the big Uniteds of the world. It just doesn't exist. Right. I really appreciate that. And I wish there was more people or more businesses out there doing good work like you guys. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, there are some, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it doesn't feel like it. Maybe you know them because you're doing good work in the world. But I'm telling you as a consumer of many things, it doesn't feel like many companies out there are looking out for our best interests. So I love talking to people who are, and I appreciate that. The one great thing is when you get into this type of 
alternative. You meet a lot of good people that have similar values and are reaching out to you to try to help you, whether it's, you know, educate you on, you know, this new opportunity or, you know, what they've learned along the way as well. So we've met some fabulous people out there in the last few years. And, you know, we're very happy about that and grateful. I love that. Yeah. And same with doing this show, you know, it does make you less jaded when you realize there are good people in the world out there doing good things and trying to help everyone get healthy and not looking after their bottom line as the primary motivation. So I appreciate that. So John, what's the best way for someone to get started or to get in touch with Accelerate or Sidera um, and just get their questions answered and get on the path to getting started? You know, one way is go to our website, either gotpurehealth.com or excelcg.com. A-C-C-E-L-C-G.com. And that tells you about all the services that we provide. But GotPureHealth.com has a lot of our alternative solutions for healthcare delineated there. We've done a whole lot of uh, material as it relates to education. And it's less salesy. It's really about education because I think this sells itself once you've educated you know, an employer group or an individual and it fits it's pretty easy from that perspective. So it's really about educating and letting them know what's available out there to them. I think this type of healthcare or methodology is going to continue to grow. Now, obviously there's going to be some mishaps along the way. There might be some companies that get into the medical cost sharing that, you know, don't have the diligence like a Sidera. That's why we did our homework and teamed up with what we believe is a strong entity with great leadership and great vision because without that, you know, it's hard for us to you know, recommend it to our clients. We want to make sure that we're doing our best due diligence at the front end to ensure we're recommending partners that we believe are going to be here for the long term. For sure. And you're an avid fitness and cyclist enthusiast. And, you know, like we said earlier, that you believe that aging is for idiots. What are some of your, you know, your personal tips for, you know, anti-aging and feeling good in your 50s and beyond? Well, with all the knowledge out there, you know, eating healthy, you know, trying to eliminate, you know, animal products. Uh, I've eliminated dairy many years ago. I still, you know, enjoy some fish once in a while. So I'm more of a pescatarian vegan, if that's even a, a term. But um, Pesca vegan yeah, is a thing. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm a pesca vegan. Um, I do cheat from time to time, maybe during the holidays, but not often. I do like red wine, so I, I do partake in that. But uh you know, really. Hey, that's one of the things in the places where people live to be a hundred. They have wine at five. Right. In yeah, the, the Mediterranean zones. diet. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm all in. Being active, I think, keeps your mind clear, and and I think anything you can do from a physical perspective. There's so many great programs out there. You know, I've been doing P90X and some of those programs for the last 14 years or so, and I'm actually going to be training with Tony Horton, the founder of P90X, in March for three days at his house. So I'm pretty excited about that. Wow. He's 62 years old and uh, looks like he's um, 35. So that's kind of my inspiration to you know, follow in his footsteps from a fitness perspective. So I think, you know, if you work hard and I think you, you're going to see the benefits quickly. And if you feel better, it's just your day is a lot easier that way. I mean, it just makes all the sense in the world. So, and it's fun in my opinion. Yeah. I agree. I love working out. I am not a P90Xer. That is hardcore. So I am very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As we get older, we become smarter. That's for sure. So um, like I said, with nutrition and all the things that I wish I would have known this when I was 20 years old would have made a huge difference. Although right? I, did, I, did, I, I did give up red meat when I was um, 20 years old because of my father and my grandparents all had heart issues. So I, I did it not really knowing what I was doing, but it's kind of evolved over the years. So it paid off. Yeah, that's amazing. I gave up red meat in my teens. And then it wasn't until my 20s that I became like pesca vegan. Right. And then in my 30s, I became fully plant-based. Yeah. So yeah, it's a journey, you know? I, the more you read about it, it, it makes all the sense to be a plant-based person just for lots of health reasons. If it's animal rights, great, but being plant-based is the way to go. I think that's your safest bet to a healthy lifestyle for sure. You are preaching to the <laughs> choir, John. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for being here. The website is gotpurehealth.com. Anything else, John? I really appreciate the time today and great questions. And hopefully your listeners can find something valuable from this. Yeah, they definitely will. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. 
Food Heals Nation, you know me, I am constantly looking for the best, most clean nutritional products to help me stay healthy and active and feeling really good, feeling my best, and I know you are too, and I consider it my responsibility to help you keep finding the best products out there, but it's hard sometimes because very often supplements and powders that have great marketing can also contain additives and emulsifiers and just ingredients that our bodies don't need and very often can even be toxic to the body when here we are trying to do our best to stay healthy, right? So that's why I'm so glad to talk about Orgain today. I'm happy I found them. They are an absolute game changer. Orgain has all kinds of organic products to fit your active lifestyle. Nutrition shakes, protein powders, meal powders, bars, even almond milk now. Orgain products are food-based and full of organic vitamins and minerals that taste delicious and provide the maximum nutrition that your body needs. So I've been using the Orgain Organic Protein. It is a plant-based protein powder and I love the creamy chocolate fudge. There's also the vanilla. I know there's a lot of vanilla people in Food Heals Nation, but I'm doing the chocolate, the creamy chocolate fudge. I'll put it in my maca chocolate latte. I'll put it in my smoothies. It's great with strawberries. It's just a really delicious shake and it helps me feel amazing and energetic. And um, I think that it's something that can improve your daily routine as well. And what I love about Orgain is they promise never to use unnecessary fillers, no artificial ingredients, no preservatives, no GMOs. They're really just like us, all about good, clean nutrition. Plus, Orgain ships right to your door. You can set up recurring deliveries and get your favorite products delivered for absolutely for free. So then you don't even have to think about ordering it again. So thanks to Orgain, I finally found the best clean product of 2020 to help keep me healthy, maximize my nutrition, and yours as well. So right now, you can save 20% off your first order. And if you subscribe, you save even more than 20%. So go to tryorgain.com slash foodheals, T-R-Y-O-R-G-A-I-N.com slash foodheals. You'll get 20% off your first order plus extra savings when you subscribe. Tryorgain.com slash foodheals. Come together, pay attention. It's time to make them listen. My generation's the future. Ready for the mission? There's a lesson in the message. Stereotypes, we shatter. We know knowledge is power. And education matters. Not blind to the cause. We know black lives matter. Stop being greedy. Too much on your platters. Love over hate. Former over the ladder. Put the guns down and put your hands up. Please don't kill our vibe. We got our peace signs up. Old schools shed light. New schools stand up. Together we rise. As one rise up. Together we rise as one rise up. All right, so that was a clip from a music video that I produced a few years ago with Music Changing Lives with Josiah Bruni, which is my next guest. And I love his story. He grew up a musician and as an adult became determined to open the way for independent artists within communities. So he would go and find at-risk youth who were at risk of dropping out of school or being exposed to gang violence or drugs or crime, took them off the streets and taught them the power of music. So he was providing them with pathways to entrepreneurial success, and he saw his students that were able to completely change their lives and become independent leaders and musicians in their own right. And so what started out as a one-room studio in his home garage has today grown into a robust after-school program, serving more than 300 youth in three community centers and four schools throughout Riverside and San Bernardino County, which is just down the road from here. So I've had the opportunity to spend time in the studio, spend time with these incredible kids, and I'm just so impressed with the work he is doing. I've wanted to have him on for a long time. So this has been a long time coming. Had an amazing time doing this music video with him. Go check out his site, musicchanginglives.org, and you can watch the full music video. It's on my Instagram at Allison Melody TV. Just click on IGTV, and it's actually the first video I ever posted on IGTV. So check that out, and please join me in welcoming the incredible Josiah Bruni to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Allison. It's been a long time coming. You know, I met you what, two years ago, and we did an amazing music video together, and I've just been following your work ever since and just enamored and amazed by what you're doing in the world. So thanks for being on. That music video is a timeless piece, um, and I'm so glad to be on with you and to see what we're doing today, even more so 
of how we're teaching the kids to stay live, stay positive, and teach others to change policy. Absolutely. And so take me back. Tell me a little bit about Music Changing Lives and how you got started and how music changed your life. Wow. Um, So music changed my life drastically. Um, I was about 13 years old, and my older brother came home and said he wanted to create his own record label. And he gave us all jobs. He was like, you're going to be the promoter. You'll be a producer. You'll do da-da-da-da. And how old were you? I was 13. This is awesome. And (laughs) imagine there's 12 of us (laughs) in a family. And he's giving each kid a job. And, and like, we thought we were just joking, and, but he was so serious. And my father father was raising um, us all together, and he was a truck driver here in the IE, um, in an empire. And he was building most of these roads. And so my older brothers were up to take the ranks, and they were mm-hmm. like, we do not want to be truckers. Mm-hmm. And so it, music it was. My dad sold his truck company, and he invested into my older brother, and then music started. That is amazing that he invested in you guys. So after that, um, we went on the road. We toured. We did songs with, like, The Brat, DJ Quick, um, The Outlaws, man, Yuck Mouth, some of the greatest, Uh, and we would just be selling our CDs out of the trunk. And we became the top on the West Coast, to be to be humbly honest. I know, um, you're so first. humble, but you, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so we sold millions of records and did it independently. And then one day I woke up and I was in a three-story mansion with my brother's and I had a vision, an epiphany of starting to teach kids how to do what we did. Mm-hmm. And I told everybody in the house, I said, man, I'm done. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I've been doing it ever since then. So you had this vision, and that, which is amazing. I feel like there's so many pivotal moments in our lifetimes like that, where you see something and then you go, I'm going to create that. And so what did you do next? How did you form Music Changing Lives? Um, so we kept selling the records, and my goal was to save enough money to buy a studio um, because I went around talking to all the studios at the time um, and asking them for studio steal time the same, and they were like, it's $100 an hour, kid. <laughs> um, no breaks. <laughs> right. Some of the guys were like 500 to to $1,000 an hour. Wow. And you still had to buy dads and real to reels at this time. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of giving a kid that has nothing, the opportunity to record music for free was nearly impossible. And so I had to buy my own studio was the goal. And so I kept pressing records and selling CDs. I paid my bills. I put a little bit aside and eventually I bought my own house. Um, and I turned it into a studio. And it was there in Marino Valley that the real live vision came to life. Um, I would start letting artists come in off the streets and I teach them how to own their intellectual properties and go out and sell their music. Um, now the downfall of it is some of the artists didn't have the vision of being positive and clean like we were trying to do. And so that's what I really wanted to get that wholesome side. My mom seen what I was doing in my home and she came in and said, you have to stop this and take it into a community center. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all took birth after that. And is that the same studio that I visited when we shot the music video? Yes. (laughs) So you've been there. How many years have you been there? 12 years now. Wow. Going on 13. And it was all a fluke. To be honest, I was going to buy a building. I was going to buy EDD. It was for sale. It was the building down the street. And the lady that was the executive director at the time, she came in right when I was about to sign the deal and asked me why I wanted the building that the government was selling. And I told her my vision. And she says, I have a son in my 
garage producing music and I told him to do something like this, but he won't listen. And can I show you how to do this with cities? And I said, yeah. And she taught me there was a Redlands Community Center that was going out of um, in a recession and they couldn't keep their programs going. And she said, they're changing the formula. She said, there's none I can promise you, but you should send them your proposal. And that's when Chief Beerman and John Harrison, the mayor at the time, helped me bring the MCL to Redlands. Wow. And so you're in Redlands now and you grew up in Altadena. And what what are the options? Like if you're a kid right now in Redlands, and you're like, I want to do music. Like, how do they work with you? How much is it? Like you said, it was a hundred bucks an hour minimum to go to a studio when you looked into it. So how are you guys different? Yeah. So our program is on a monthly fee. Um, it's $50 a month. And if a kid can't pay that, they go on a sliding scale to where it's $25 a month. And if you can't pay that, then we help sponsor the 25 and we tell you we got to um, volunteer five hours a month. Um, can adults do this? This is amazing. Like, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, adults can come as too. Uh, we had an 80 year old guy in there. The other day doing uh, Frank Sinatra, Sinatra, sorry. And so we work with everyone. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember when we shot the music video, you know, it was all about the kids and uplifting their voices, but the parents were so involved, you know, writing the music, helping produce it, directing it, you know, everyone was just, it, it was just such a magical, like, community experience where everyone just had their part and their talent and was like, all right, we're going to come together and do this. And we didn't plan very much, Josiah, like, Remember, we just threw that thing together in like a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think it was seven days exact you gave me. You guys had another event going. Um, and I told you I got the perfect family for it. Yes. And that's how mm -hmm. MCR is. Um, it's all family oriented. And I want to teach them how to own it and own their intellectual properties. And then start a family business. It was a family. You know, I feel like I was welcomed into your family as this random person who no one knew. And we just came in and we made something really creative and magical together. So I totally agree with you. And I see that in what you've created. And so when you talk about like teaching people how to own their own music, like is there this fear that they will learn how to, how to create music and then have their rights being taken away? Like what happened when you were growing up? How, what did you see? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I grew up in the era of like Criss Cross, <laughs> TLC, Prince, just to name a few. And if you know music, they had some crazy experiences with their royalties and owning their music. Mm -hmm. And so that is what opened my eyes to say, I have to teach a kid how to own their publishing and royalties and then sell from that way. Right. Instead of doing it the other way, how they were telling us, sign your deal, give me 50% of your royalties, and then go out and make a name. Now, in the entertainment industry, 50% means 100%. You know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> <laughs> most people were doing what's called a 360 deal um, as well, selling their likeness, their images. Um, it was just sick me when you would read some of these contracts of what people would do to become famous. And Music Changing Lives is an organization that gives back and you really intertwine social justice and music. You give back to your community. I saw you this morning on Facebook Live. How many meals did you deliver this morning? 5,000. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> yes, Monday through Friday what a partnership of a good friend of mine, Edward Brantley, um, of Impact. We distribute 5,000 meals a day um, throughout the Inland Empire in L.A. County. Is this something that came about because of the quarantine? What are you seeing? What is happening that you're seeing the need that you have to fill? Why, are, why do so many people need meals right now? Yeah, it was when COVID-19 hit and we start seeing our unemployment rate spike. Yeah. Um, as just an individual that knows what it's like to have nothing at times, I said, you got to create a scenario where we become essential now and kind of mission drift for these few months to help out any way we can. Um, and so we just got on the phone and 
we start calling different partners. We have this group called One Inland Empire, um, and it's a cohort of about 24 different organizations. And from us getting on the phone and just saying, what can we do? Um, we said, we're going to start feeding and we're going to provide masks and we're going to provide art supplies and we're going to keep things going but we're gonna find out how to do it safely. And thanks to our partners um, at Golden Era Production, they brought to us this panel um, that taught us like how to go out into the community and keep ourselves safe and others safe and prevent bacteria and uh, contamination and things like that. So we start distributing those books to different organizations that we're serving and saying, hey, you, this is what you should do. Um, to be safe and to be healthy. And then after that, we just start serving in any other capacity we could. Another thing that I wanted to address was, I remember specifically watching you on a Facebook Live recently, and you were talking about how important it was that, because because whatever, everything that happened with COVID was like tragedy, you know, world event number one, and then all of a sudden it was George Floyd, and world event number two was the massive amount of people coming out to protest and march against, you know, systemic racism that exists, and and stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I saw you on your Facebook Live talking about how important it was that we declare that racism is a public health crisis. And why is that so important to understand? Wow. Thank you for that. Number one, I think the disparities that people are facing nowadays just are despicable. It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, if I'm a citizen why am I still defending my civil rights right. to just live? And that's from Mal Malcolm X. And mm. you know how many years that ago was, or how long ago that was, I apologize. And we're still having to defend our skin tone, our lives, just to breathe, just to live. The guy was cashing a $20 check right. and lost his life to feed his family. I don't know what kind of check it was or what. It was a fake $20 bill. But man, I wish I could have gave that guy food. Mm -hmm. So yeah, demon racism, a public health issue. I think it's time to really address the differences that we have in our communities. Um, it's like I said earlier, if I'm a citizen, why do I have to still defend my civil rights? Why am I not allowed the same treatment as another individual? And I paid my taxes. So I pay for this officer to harass my people. And they're getting increases. They're getting salary, pensions to kill people, mm -hmm. to hurt people. And some of them are out there doing good and doing right. But the ones that are doing wrong need to be held accountable. And we need to clean house with anyone that is a racist in a public office where the public is paying their paycheck. And they right. should lose all pensions if we find out you have any of this in your tension. And so with that, we're asking every city to join force with us, uh, to adopt this resolution, and to deem racism a public health crisis. And if that is adopted, what will that mean? Accountability, transparency. Um, so the first step is creating community boards. I'm following the civilrights.org right now. And it's this document called the New Era of Public Safety. And basically, it's a toolkit for an advocacy group like mine to create fair, safe, an effective community policing. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, we want to go into the school districts and the school boards and find all of the records of teachers that have any ill wills or things like this and get rid of them. The tenure thing needs to go. Mm -hmm. Just because you've been with a school for 10 years or something like that and I can't be touched? No. If you have any type of racism or hatred in your heart, 
you should not be teaching our kids. And so that's our ultimate mission, clean house. Clean house. I'm with you. I read a stat recently that um, people of color are 2.5 times more likely to be killed by police officers than white individuals. And I thought that stat alone, that's a public health crisis, right? Racism is a public health crisis. And the fact that very often um, low-income communities, which are often communities of color, lack access to some of the basic human needs, like clean drinking water, or they live in food deserts. Talk to me a little bit about that and what you've seen and what you've experienced. Yeah, so what we've experienced are the different policies that are implemented in our cities. So one are chuck holes and strangle holes, requiring warning before shooting, right? Requiring exhaust of all alternatives before shooting should be permitted in our communities. But it's not. Mm -hmm. You see videos over and over of our people being manhandled and brutalized by peace officers. And enough's enough. We need comprehensive reporting. We need a requirement that we as a community can elect who's our officers. The same way how we judge an elected assembly member with a scorecard. We want to judge our peace officers and our teachers the same way so things can really change. Absolutely. So talk to me about like how, what can we do around mental health and what are some tools that we can do to heal ourselves so that we don't become a part of the problem or we let go of our anger so we can be a part of the solution or our fear or whatever it is, whatever side you're on, you've got feelings. So how can we be you know, our best selves by working on ourselves so that we can be a part of the change and the solution? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say for me personally, what I do is I get my Zen sessions. I love good baths. I love aromas, candles, mm -hmm. and I take at least an hour a day to meditate and think about me and what I'm doing. Damn, you're to beating be the me. change. Huh? You're beating me. Good job. An hour a day. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 20 and, minutes a day. <laughs> yes. Get to that hour and just give yourself some time and think about what you're doing and then an analyze it all and come back and say, what's the most important? What really matters? What's going to be just and fair for everyone, not just me? And that's how I look at every day. And so I think once we all get on that accord, it's like Kennedy said, what not can my country do for me, but what can I do for my country? That's when we'll be in a better place, I think. I mean, mic drop. It's just, it's about being selfless and going, well, what can I give and how can I serve, right? And that'll change the world. You serving one person could change their lives. Music changes lives. You're doing this every day, right? It's like, how can we be more selfless? Truly. Let's try to just listen and then understand. Be genuinely selfless. Don't think about yourself and what you want out of this. Think about what they want out of it all the way, how it can help them. A lot of people I see them do this thing as like a fluff to make themselves feel good. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I wanna gain my name back or I wanna be looked at as this person that does care. It shouldn't mean anything like that. It should just be, I wanna be a good human. <laughs> yeah. You would think. Okay. <laughs> I just want to be a good human, and I want to respect other humans. We need to get away from this labeling, oh, you're black, you're white, you're Mexican, or Latinx, or this, whatever. I'm cool with it if they with it, but me personally, we need to get back to when we were all just humans. I mean, mic drop again, Josiah. I just think, you know, I agree with you. And I think it's about empathy. I think it's about, like you said, being selfless, looking outside of yourself, looking outside of your own worldview, really listening and then going, well, what can I do? Well, for me, I have a platform. I have a podcast. So, okay, 
I can be a part of the solution by listening and by giving up my platform to people who have a voice like you and like so many other wonderful, amazing people I know who are doing incredible things in the world. And it's just like, yeah, post this black square to Instagram, but you got to do so much more than that. I saw a protest sign and it was like, your Instagram post does not save my life. Um, you know, <laughs> <Just> like... <laughs> So it's just like, don't just care. I'm in the animal act activism world, as you know, and they always say your depression about factory farming and the brutal slaughter of animals does not save an animal. You have to use your voice. You have to get out there and be active. And it's the same with anything politically that you believe in. It's the same with what's going on right now. And I just think that we all have a voice. We all have social media. We all have a few followers or friends that respect us and care what we think. And so you might say one thing that could change someone's mind or could make a difference or could make them think differently. So what are you going to say today? You know, what are you going to talk about on your Facebook? Everyone was going live all through quarantine. I was like, wow, everyone just loves to go live during quarantine about being in their house. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, use it for good now. <laughs> it's time. Now that everyone's exactly. watching your lives, go live for something good. Yes. I think that's where we all need to get to. Um, that's what we use the platforms for, um, just to show the good we're doing. And we don't keep it in the people's face. We keep it in our staff's face. <laughs> <laughs> like, these are the people helping the people. So be kind, be compassionate. Don't try to use people as props, but just be selfless and do what you love doing. Yeah. So the website is Music Changing Lives and people can follow you there. You're on Instagram at Music Changing Lives. And I know you recently pledged to feeding, what, a thousand families per week for the next six weeks. Is that right? Man, it started off as we just did, wanted to do 20,000 mm -hmm. and we've reached now 60,000 families Damn. and now we're doing 5,000 a day. So 25,000 a week. <laughs> That's amazing. And we're trying to double that. So how can we volunteer? How can we donate food, donate money? Tell us all the goods. Um, so if you want to volunteer Monday through Friday, we have an opportunity where you could come out and help back and distribute the food to those that go out and serve it. If you want to get in the field and actually distribute the food, we have several locations uh, you can volunteer at to distribute food Monday through Saturday. Or Monday through Sunday, if you'd like to donate cash, it's musicchanginglives.org. All right, Josiah. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. I love you guys. Thank oh, you for you having too. me. Um, thank you for Food Heals, because it does. Without food, we have no energy. And so thank you for that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the work that you do, Josiah. I really appreciate it. Do you want clearer skin, more energy, and a simple pill you can pop to create beauty from the inside out? Um, yes, please. How about a more sustainable, natural way to improve your workouts, sharpen your focus, cut back on caffeine, and fight your chocolate cravings? Then look no further than Beauty Bits. Beauty Bits are pure spirulina algae tablets. They are made by our friends over at energybits.com. Beauty Bits are your answer for looking younger and feeling healthier. With over 40 micronutrients and plenty of protein, Beauty Bits will stop your cravings in their tracks, improve your focus, and give you a steady stream of energy throughout your day. So how does it work? The spirulina in Beauty Bits contains vitamin E, selenium, and tyrosine, which are all known for their powerful anti-aging effects. Spirulina helps your skin retain moisture, which is a major key to maintaining smoother and more hydrated skin. Check them out. You can get 20% off your Beauty Bits by going to energybits.com using the coupon code FOODHEALS. And the most amazing side effect of Beauty Bits is not only will they make you look radiant, they'll make you feel radiant, and they'll supercharge and super boost your immune system as well with greens. So 20% off Beauty Bits, energybits.com, coupon code FOODHEALS. The Baby Maker is our vision of the future of sustainable transportation. It gives you the freedom to ride faster, climb higher, and explore further than ever before. The Baby Maker is more than just a bike, it's a movement. If you want to keep more money in your wallet, have more time for the people you love, and breathe more clean air, then this is the bike for you. The Baby Maker is ready for mass production, so reserve yours today and tell your friends, because with your help, 
and our expertise, we're gonna build you a bike that will change the way you think about riding forever. All right, Food Heals Nation, that was a clip from the most successful crowdfunding campaign of 2020, which raised over $12 million for the vegan startup founded by today's guest. Please join me in welcoming Rob Rast. Hey, Allison. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Absolute pleasure. Look forward to chatting with you. Yes, I'm so glad to have you. And uh, yeah, the video um, on the Indiegogo is absolutely beautiful and so compelling. So I would love to hear more about the Baby Maker. Thank you so much. Well, the Baby Maker is kind of been a long project for us. We first started getting into the e-bike industry in 2014. I met my co-founder on Airbnb and we just had this dream to build the coolest electric bike out there. Everything at the time you'd see these wires everywhere and big batteries, they were ugly. And it's something where, you know, the average person wouldn't want to be caught dead on this thing because he looks so dorky. So <laughs> our, our, our thing was to make a bike that looks good, that performs well, that you'd be proud to ride, kind of like a cool motorcycle. We started there and it's just been a mission of just making them better, better every time we finally, the technology is there, the battery capacity to make a bike that looks just like a normal road bike but it can hit 25, 28 miles an hour, climb any hill and go up to 50 miles in a charge. Yeah, the coolest thing I loved about the video, and they are very sleek looking, by the way, but you see a person riding a regular bike uphill and then just someone rolls by and smokes them in the baby <laughs> maker. And I'm like, oh, I want to be that person. <laughs> Heck yeah. That's the biggest thing with the bike is hills. Like everybody we talk to who's, who's bought one or rides an e-bike. It just sucks climbing hills. Like nobody wants to do, it, especially in summer, just sitting there, working away, grinding at a hill. We just want to go places. We want to get there, fly up the hill, and enjoy the ride. Yeah, and I'm the person that just gets off the bike and pushes it up the hill because I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> like, totally. You know? So, how does the technology work? Like, tell me more about it. So, there's a high capacity lithium battery hidden inside the frame of the bike in a, the down tube of the bike. And then there's a stealth motor in the back wheel of the bike and a sensor between the pedals. And it senses when you're pedaling and depending on what level you set the bike in between one and five, it will give you help from that motor. So if you're in level one, for example, you just get a tiny amount of help from the bike. You could even put it in zero and just be you just like a normal bike. Or if you really want to fly, get up a hill, you put it in level five and you're getting up to 500 watts from the motor. And to put that in perspective, the average rider in a sprint will do maybe 250 watts. So you're getting your own pedal power, 250 plus 500 from the motor, effectively three times the power that you could on a normal bike with the addition of that motor. Wow. And it really does look powerful based on, you know, the videos that I've seen. And so tell me about, you have the most successful crowdfunding campaign of 2020 so far that we know of, and you raised $2 million in 24 hours. How did you get people so excited about this? How did this go viral? Oh man, it was, it was a process. We were actually looking to launch it last year and we just didn't have everything ready for it. Uh, it was a bit last minute and the Christmas season isn't a great time to launch a a crowdfunding project. So I had went mm. off, I got a sprinter van. I've loaded the the van with bikes and it just went along the coast filming videos, having fun on the bikes, meeting our customers. And then we eventually built a community of, of people who just love the bike, were super interested in it, asking, hey, when are you guys going to launch? When are you guys going to launch? When can I get my hands on it? And uh, we just built a big community, finally launched it March 17th. And in the first two minutes i think we we broke our funding goal within 12 minutes or something we were at like four hundred thousand, and then by wow. the end of the first day over a million dollars it was it was just insane so the whole team we were you know in tears because all that hard work paid off i can't even imagine just sitting there and, and staring at the campaign and it's going up and up and up and you're like, <laughs> is this really happening right now right somebody pinch me that's pretty amazing. Okay, so that's what you're doing now. And but take me back because you were a reality star in China. Like I need to, I need to know this the Rob Rass story. Can you take <laughs> me back through that? All right. So uh, I do have some experience in China. It kind of started with a mentor I had in high school. Every time I met him, he was the most successful dude I knew. He had private jets. He owned the airports. He had like four airports under his name. And every time I met him, he said, Rob, if you want to be successful someday, 
you've got to learn Chinese and go to China. And I'm sitting there, you know, 14, 15 years old thinking, what are you talking about? You're not Chinese. You've never been to China. You don't speak the language. <laughs> but he had a vision. And then I started seeing China everywhere in the newspaper, the news, the Beijing Olympics were on. I was studying mechanical engineering at UC Irvine, where there's a big Chinese population. So I started learning Chinese. Two years in, my mentor calls me up and says, Rob, I think it's time for you to go to China. Check it out. And uh, if you go check it out this summer, I'll, I'll pay for your plane ticket. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I thought about it and I was like, well, you know, how can I pass this opportunity up? I regret this the rest of my life. So got the one-way ticket, flew over to China, not knowing anybody. It just picked a place on the map that was close to the ocean because it sounded cool and uh, took it one step at a time from there. And how was it? Because did you go plant-based when you were in China? How's the food there? What's the What's the situation like? The food in China is very hit and miss. And I didn't go plant-based until uh, just less than a year ago, actually. I went to China and I had been raised to think that, you know, men need to eat meat to be strong men. So I was a big meat eater for 30 years of my life. I went to China and it was very hit and miss there. You'd get some food that was amazing, dumplings, sorts of things like that. And then a lot of the food is like, you know, chopped up bones and stuff. And mm. that was not the most pleasant thing in mm -hmm. the world for sure. Yeah, that would be really rough for me. Okay. So you're in China and you are starring in a reality show. Like I, I, I have to hear this story. <laughs> All right. So how that came about is after our first product launch on uh, Indiegogo, that one was very successful as well. Two but million, not for the bike. So this was something else. This was for our first round of bikes in 2016. Okay. Uh, we had three models, our very first electric bikes. That did $2 million in 60 days. So a good oh. campaign, but not nowhere near the baby maker. Okay, yeah. After that, Indiegogo had a panel where they um, they invited me to speak to like up-and-coming Indiegogo campaigners who wanted some advice. At the end of that, I'm walking through the audience, and this girl comes up to me, looks me in the eye, says hey, we're doing this TV show. And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm in. Sign me up. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't know what she had to say, but it sounded awesome. I'm in. And then she's like, yeah, so it's um, it's called Beauty and the Geek. It's four guys and four girls in a mansion. I'm like, come on. Like, how much do I have to pay? Sign me up. I'm in. Oh, wait. And they wanted you to be the geek in this situation? I, I think, I like to think I was one of the beauties. <laughs> <laughs> so the girls were the geeks? Uh, no, so there were there were four beautiful, beautiful girls, and they were all kind of in kind of in the acting modeling industry, mm -hmm. and then three three normal guys and one super geeky guy, like tremendously geeky. Okay, and that was kind of you know the comedic relief. And as soon as you get on on this show, the very first thing is like you play a little ge game that determines which room you're going to be in, and you're living in the room with another girl. So it's just you and this girl in a room and then you decide the sleeping arrangements amongst yourself. It was, it was just wild. It was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of, uh, emotional stress I'd say, but so much I fun, a great experience. You. So is this on Netflix? Like, how do we watch this? This, sounds this amazing. is, this is on YouTube. Okay. It's, oh man, if in your show notes, I'll have to write you the Chinese because I think you need to use the Chinese characters to search for it. Really? It's okay. called Menu GPN. And you're fluent in Chinese. Yes, I'm fluent. So on the show, are you speaking Chinese? The whole show is Chinese, except for the occasional, wow. okay, oh yeah. How long did it take you to learn that? That was a while. It's a it's a continuous progress. I think even for native Chinese speakers, they never fully learn the language because there's so many characters. But uh, to get to conversational fluency, about two years. That's two years of courses in America and then one year in China. Yeah, I think it's like once you immerse yourself in the culture, you kind of force yourself to learn. You have to learn. That's huge. And I've got a tip for anybody trying to learn a language. Literally, if you can get through one textbook, like first year level of any language, switch from that to Netflix or whatever, whatever service they have in that language and just start watching shows in that language because you get, especially in like China, 
Mexico, you'll get these shows with 70, 80 episodes, 45 minutes each, and it's the same people, the same topics, and it draws you in. And that repetition, you learn it so fast. That's a really good point. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. So you're in China. What brought you back to the U.S.? So we started the company in China in uh, 2016, our first launch. And then we, we moved down to the factory. We're living at the factory to make sure every bite came out perfect. Pete, my co-founder, he was in the U.S. for a while, kind of working on our promotions and customer service out here. And I was, you know, I was the China guy, Mr. China. And then uh, because he's from England, his visa ran out in the States. So we switched places. This is in 2018, mm -hmm. the very first part of 2018. So I came to the U.S. and we switched roles. So that was pretty exciting because we each have our unique touch on the business. So I've been in charge of kind of starting our headquarters up here in San Diego and building the team and now all operations here. Nice. And so is this your main focus? How do we get how do we get the bike right now? How do you get the bike? You can go to our website, www.flx.bike, and look for the Baby Maker or any of the other awesome models on the site. Okay. And where does the name the Baby Maker come from? Because that has a lot of connotations oh, to it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so originally, Pete and I, um, Pete's, Pete's my co-founder, by the way. He's, he's a Brit. Awesome dude. Whenever we come up with a new product, we'll just text each other back and forth, just spitballing names. And he sent over the baby maker. And I think he was just trying to make me laugh, but I loved it. He loved it. And uh, and we just called it that to begin with. And then hearing people's reactions on it was what really sealed the deal because it was a very, very mixed reaction on the name. Some people, you know, they'd hear it and they'd laugh and smile and they'd get it. And other people would get so angry. Uh, this is a, a very small minority of people about the word baby maker. They were calling oh. us sexist. They were saying, how could you name a bike that? I hope you die. Oh and, my God. And that's when we knew it has to be the baby maker. Like, <laughs> this is our, our statement, our freedom of speech. Like, it's just a word, guys. There's nothing to get upset about. It's the baby maker. Some people hear it and laugh. Some people hear it and they'll be upset about it. Who do you think goes to bed happier? Right. And you know what? It's like the more the more polarizing, the better, because that's the more people talking about you. And there's no such thing as bad press, right? Totally. So the haters have one more reason to hate us and talk about us. So no complaints there. Yeah. And they're not buying the product anyway. So why not? Exactly. Okay. So did you say you met Pete on Airbnb? How did that work? Yes. I was in China there. This was 2014, the end of 2014. I had an extra room in my apartment, threw it up on Airbnb, and Pete said, oh, I mate, I'm coming to China. I need a place to stay. Can I crash there? And I said, yeah, all right. He shows up in the middle of the night, uh, like full leather jacket, shaved head. He looked like Jason Statham meets Bear Grylls <laughs> and acted that way too. Just a total uh, off-the-wall, go-getter, adventure guy, and we really hit it off. He started, uh, he was just exploring Beijing at the time where we were living. So I gave him my little motorbike and he'd go take that out. And he came back one day and he said, I'm noticing all these electric scooters out here. These would be great for Australia, which is where he lived at the time. And we thought about it, thought that was cool, but nobody would want to ride those. They were too ugly. They're not cool. So that idea morphed into electric bikes, which we were both way, way more passionate about. And we ended up designing our own. What an amazing story that you met in that way. And then you just became fast friends with, you know, complimentary visions. Wild, right? We'd never known each other, ended up business partners and now amazing friends. I love how life does that for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're plant-based and um, you attribute the fact that you wanted to try this to a documentary that I love called The Game Changer. So take me through that journey and how did a plant-based diet help you and enhance your athletic performance and change your life? Totally. So as mentioned, you know, I was a big meat eater my whole life thinking I'm also big into bodybuilding, fitness, thinking, you know, I got to eat half a cow to maintain my muscles. This is what, <laughs> you know, was bred into me. Right. And, um, I had been presented with some arguments about going plant-based many, many times before, and they fell on my deaf ears. Unfortunately, I was a big skeptic, kind of stubborn in my ways, thinking, well, this is propaganda, this is that. 
And uh, my business partner, Pete, he went vegan, I believe in 2017, full on vegan. He was touting it. And still I was stubborn about it until I watched The Game Changers. And it was the first documentary that really presented it in a great way with a lot of evidence. And the performance-based aspect of it is what really sold me. If they had started that documentary and just said, you're going to get, you're going to, this is good for your dick. I'd, I'd be sold <laughs> right away. <laughs> That's the best part, right? When yeah. you take the athletes through that process and you realize that, you know, your performance in that way can be ma- massively improved by eating plant-based. I mean, they should make a film just on that. I agree. They should open with that. <laughs> totally. That was like 40 minutes in. So the casual watcher, like, I'm like, come on, just wait, just wait for it. Trust me, you're going to need it. But seeing that in the blood, the clouded blood, I was like, oh my God, I'm putting this shit in my body. Yeah, that was a good scene too. Oh, totally. I thought, you know, I've been a big meat eater for 30 years of my life. I was just about to turn 30. All my life, I've done it this way. Why not give this a chance? There must be a reason so many people are hyped up on this. Let me give it a chance and see how it works. So I went and got a full blood panel before switching, made the switch. And then three months in, I got another blood panel to kind of see how it would affect me. And what changed? Well, on my first blood panel, I found out, you know, I'm a fit dude too. At 30 Mm -hmm. years old, my cholesterol was off the charts. It was, I, I forget the exact numbers. I think it was 180 where healthy is like... 80 or something like that, or below 120. And um, don't quote me on these numbers. I'll have to look at the look at the That's exact, okay. I don't look know at the exact numbers. Yeah, if I'm out of range here, y'all know it got better. So on my next <laughs> uh, next full blood panel after three months on a vegan diet, only three months, my cholesterol went to you know green light completely within a healthy range in just three months of not eating garbage. Wow. And we see in the Game Changers, the athletes that go from um, being a heavy meat eater to going plant-based and how much their athletic performance um, improves. Did you see that as well? Yes, that was that was amazing. And that was a big part of why I switched as well. You know, I'm zero or 100. And most of the times I'm at 100. So I want I want every piece I can get not only just for uh, fitness, working out, exercising, but especially performance at work because I go all out and I want to be able to go longer, harder and with more mental clarity. Yeah. Talk about the mental clarity because I find that as well. Even now I've been plant-based for years, but it's like, okay, I will get more mental clarity if I do more juicing and less eating of, you know, complex carbs. And like, I I know for myself what I can do to gain that mental clarity, but giving up meat and dairy and sugar and all the things really does give you that clarity of mind. Tell me about your experience. Totally. Totally. So I had always eaten pretty clean uh, with the exception of the meat, you know, all home prepared. I don't go out to eat much, don't eat much sugars, carbs. But after, after eating a meal with quite a bit of meat and meat protein in it, you just feel that slog. It feels like you're dragging around, you know, a kettlebell from your legs (laughs) Uh, mentally too. you, You feel that way for a few hours afterwards. I thought that was just a part of life, but after switching to plant-based foods, I never felt that again. I still certainly feel tired from the exercise from time to time, but I can I can put a lot more work in and I believe it's better quality work as well. Yes. So we were talking right before we started um, about how right now gyms are closed and it's not as easy to work out as it used to be if you can't meet your trainer and things like that. So what is what is some advice that you have for being active and getting the exercise in during the whatever you want to call it, quarantine? That's an easy one. For everybody listening, you're going to need one FLX bicycle. <laughs> and you're going to need to hit the road. Okay, what is the FLX? That's a baby maker? FLX, that's the name of our company. So that encompasses the baby maker, all the all the models we make. But the cool thing about that is a lot of people use them for exercise because you can choose a level of pedal assist and get as much or as little exercise as you want. So if you want to that's pump great. it up, you turn down the motor power. In addition to that, you know, that was a cheap commercial. But, no, it's okay. That's why we're here. But <laughs> You're allowed to sell yourself. A lot of people are switching to bikes, and that has been good for our business, despite the circumstances. What I've been doing a lot of is I switched from going to the gym and lifting weights to doing band work. 
uh, just at the warehouse. And I'm hyped on that because I'm getting, I feel like just as high quality workout, but in a different way and saving all the time of driving to the gym, coming back, all that stuff. So it's way more efficient for me. I'm doing that so and surfing. Resistance bands? Is that what resistance you mean? bands? Yeah. Got it. And and sorry, that and surfing. That and a lot of surfing. Yeah, and that smokes me for sure. Yeah. Well, it's like let's go outdoors as much as we can because let's get that vitamin D. Let's get that sunshine. All the I believe the ocean is healing. So if you have an ocean nearby, if you can hike nearby, you know what can you do in your city? Certainly biking as well, um, and just get outside because I think that's one thing that you know, being forced out of the gym sucks because you have your routine that you're used to, but it also challenges you to go outside and do something different. So I think it's actually a good time for all of us. Oh, absolutely. So eye opening. And a big thing uh, when it comes to fitness, a lot of people struggle with is the cardio aspect of fitness, you know, getting that, that long standing cardio in that's going to be burning fat and stuff. And a lot of people give up on their diets or their workout plans, because sitting on a treadmill for an hour just sucks or Stairmaster. It's awful. I'd shoot myself if I had to do that every day. But you can find an activity that gives you just as much exercise and is actually fun to do and doesn't feel like exercise. It could be surfing, volleyball, uh, frisbee, golf, whatever it is, find something that you love and just do that. And you'll never have to do a second of cardio again in your life. Yes. Running around with your kids, running around with your dogs. I know for me, I love running, but it's been so hot lately that I'm just like, I can't. And I'm like, okay with that, but I'll just be running around in the yard with my dogs and I'm working up a sweat <laughs> pretty quick and my heart's pounding pretty quick. So it's not hard to get things in. I just don't want people to be like, I know we talk about the quarantine 15 and we're kind of kidding around, but everyone's, I mean, many people are suffering from it and it's okay. Like, let's accept that. Okay, great. We sat on our ass for a while, but now let's get back to work, right? Yes. Back to work guys. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we've got the baby maker. What's coming next? I heard something about some electric skateboards on the way. Yes. So I also make electric skateboards. That's another business of mine. It's called Miles Board and just a passion project totally for me. I love skating, longboarding. I started that in college. And what we do is we'd run up the stairs of a parking garage, skate down, and you'd have all the speed going down and then you have to run back up the stairs. It was the most fun thing in the world. So you had to go up the stairs with an electric skateboard. You just hit the, hit the gas on it or, you know, the throttle and you can get that speed anywhere on a flat, up a hill even. It's incredible. Got it. Okay. So it's not going to turn a newbie into a skater. It's just going to help an already skater do their thing. Uh, yes, but also a newbie, it is easier to learn on electric skateboard, in my opinion. Cruising anyways, you're not doing tricks on these things, but because you don't have to push and stuff, which can be a bit awkward, you can just stand on it slowly, use the gas, put it in level one when you're learning. And then when you're used to it, crank it up a bit and have some more fun. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk a little business. What is the secret to success with these launching these crowdfunding campaigns? Because you've done multiple successful ones and a lot of people put up Indiegogo or um, GoFundMe campaigns and they don't get a lot of traction. So mm. talk to me about some of the strategies behind that. So there's a few things to do. The biggest thing that's helped us is what Indiegogo recommends. If you just go to Indiegogo's website, there's resources for people looking to launch a campaign. And it kills me because I think 90% of people who want to launch something, they don't even take the time. It would take you half a day to read through their materials. They have best practices. You know, they run thousands and thousands of campaigns on this platform and they're giving you the instruction booklet. Like this is what we've noticed works. This is what works. Do it this way. So very first stop is to read that. That's what we did in the beginning. It was a huge help. And one critical thing they told us is not to just, not to just go build your thing and launch it and wait for money to come in. Cause that's not how it works is number one to build your community first, find out who's interested in this product, who's going to buy it, build that community of people first, and then launch it and you tell people, okay, now you can get it. And then they all go, they get it. It builds some momentum and building from that is way easier than building from zero and waiting for people to find you. 
Yes, that's such a good point. And listen, it's so easy to build community these days because you can, if you don't want to start a podcast like this, you could start a YouTube series or you could just go Facebook Live or whatever. You you know, we have smartphones now. If you are a person with a smartphone, you are a person of influence who can change the world. So you can build that community very quickly and easily harnessing the power of the smartphone. So I think that's such a good point. So build that community, make sure they will ask them what they want and then create it for them and then do an Indiegogo campaign, right? <laughs> totally. Exactly. The other thing that's super critical there, um, so having that community, your offer has got to be compelling because you're asking people, number one, Everybody, almost everybody on Indiegogo has never, you know, been in business. This is their very first product launch. So you're telling people to trust you as a stranger with their money for three, six months, even a year at a time while you build their product. So you've got to have an offer that's so compelling that makes sense for them to invest their money with you for that long period of time and also build the trust with them so they know you're the person who's going to deliver what you said is accurate. You're not just blowing smoke up their butt to get their money and run away, which unfortunately does also exist. Right. Okay. So is there any other advice that you would give to a wellness entrepreneur who wants to get their products or services in front of more people? Video. Video is the, the last piece that's been very critical for us because the most effective form of communication is not written word. You get maybe 7% of your meaning through written word. Uh, that's what the scientists say. But if you're in person, you can see people's body language. You can get a feel for them. You can feel the energy coming from their face when they talk. And unfortunately, you can't do that with everybody. You can't go to every state, every city and talk to people. But you can make a video on YouTube and really spread that mat message, show people the passion you have for the product. And just from that, people can really get to know you and get to trust you and what you're doing. So video is a critical, critical part. Yes, I could not agree more. I was in film production for 15 years, so Amazing. I'm with you on that. And yeah, you have a beautiful video, very well shot, very high quality, great music, just really sucks you right in. And the visuals are great on the Indiegogo. And like I said, you know, I still have that visual just from watching it of, I understand what the bike does because I watched on the video, the slow person going up the hill and I'm like, oh, that, uh -huh. there's me. And then the person's zipping right by them. And I was like, I need to be that person. And Heck that yeah. sells it right there, you know? I wish you could come and try that hill. It's like you get 40 feet up it and have to stop and, and walk up. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, I can. Next time I'm in San Diego, I'll come Heck try yeah. out a bike. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Rob. Is there anything else that you want to share with Food Heals Nation today? Um, that's it. I am doing a giveaway. We have a monthly Ooh. giveaway for an electric skateboard or an electric bike. If you oh. add me on Instagram and send me the word giveaway, I'll send you the instructions. I'm doing it right now because I want that bike. Heck yeah. <laughs> I don't want the skateboard though. I only want the bike. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Awesome. So how do they follow you on Instagram? It's at rob.rast, R-A-S-T at rob.rast. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here, Rob. I really appreciate it. Tell everyone one more time where they can find you online, your website, follow you, all, any any other places that they can stalk you. <laughs> sure thing. To check out the bike, go to www.flx.bike. We've got loads of models there for the skateboards, milespower.com. And to find me and join the giveaway, add me on Instagram at rob.rast and send me the word giveaway. DM it to me. You'll find me. This has been an absolute pleasure, Allison. Thank you so much for having me on. we got to do this again soon. Food Heals Nation, did you know that Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take about 20,000 breaths per day? According to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. And in some cases, this is scary, up to 100 times more polluted. The data shows that air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million premature deaths globally. That's why it's 
so important to filter the air in our homes. You remember my story after discovering toxic mold in my home almost a year ago, I realized the importance of having multiple high quality air filters in my home to protect myself, to protect the air that I'm breathing and the air that my beagle Lily is breathing. Think about everyone in your household, your family members, your roommates, your kids, your cats, your dogs, your pets, right? We have to be so conscious of the air that we're breathing inside, but that's why I'm obsessed with Air Doctor. You can visit airdoctorpro.com, use the code FOODHEALS, and you can get up to 39% off an air purifier. Air Doctor filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants and allergens like pollen and pet dander and dust mites and mold and even bacteria and viruses. So your lungs don't have to. It's so easy to set up. It's quiet and I can rest easy knowing I'm breathing cleaner air every day when I'm working from home. If you work from home like me, you've got to filter your air. So head on over to airdoctorpro.com, use the promo code FOODHEALS, and depending on the model you pick, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. This is exclusive to Food Heals Nation listeners. You'll also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Check it out by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com, airdoctorpro.com, and use promo code FOODHEALS. When Luca's mom was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, she ran from doctor's office to doctor's office, getting more and more prescription medicine while her health just got worse, which is exactly what happened to my mom when she first had multiple sclerosis followed by cancer. Every pill introduced a new side effect and every side effect warranted a new pill. It was a vicious cycle with no healing in sight. In Luca's case, his mom found a different route. She found a doctor who specialized in root cause medicine. After 12 months, she completely reversed her autoimmune condition. And her son Luca began to think, why isn't all of medicine this personalized and data driven? And why doesn't everyone have access to this type of information? And that's when he created Index Health. Stories like these remind me of why I do this show, Food Heals Nation, and why I love Index Health, which you can learn more about at indexclinic.com slash foodheals. With Index Health, you get access to board-certified functional medicine trained doctors and functional trained nutritionists who use advanced lab tests to diagnose and treat chronic conditions. All treatment plans are 100% personalized, and doctor appointments are one hour long. They really take the time to deep dive into their patient's health. I only wish that something like Index Health was around when my mom was sick. To schedule your first appointment, visit indexclinic.com slash foodheals. Again, that's indexclinic.com slash foodheals. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to actually start using their $39.99 a month gym membership. If you experience any of these symptoms, Snapchat your trainer immediately. 